Hello and welcome back to a critique of Outlast. And hell, we've been through this much and I haven't really mentioned gameplay at all yet about this game, so uh, how about we, well, say no more and jump right in. Now the devs are probably expecting that you've played a few games before, including but not limited to amnesia and survival horror in general. This isn't even solely about mechanics, however. They treat you to a full paragraph in the beginning that will let you know the reason you are heading here, and it is that you're a plucky and brave journalist, but also that you're going to get screwed in terms of fighting back. They front load the game with the whole helpless mechanic, since Amnesia at this point has become famous for that very concept, and so why not let people know that they are getting into this right away, before there is even gameplay to speak of? Aside from that, we get a standard warning about content that I see as more of a brag since nobody would have bought this game without knowing something about the content, right? Well, regardless, you are a little bit more prepared for what comes next when receiving this sort of introduction, and I wouldn't deny them that it is a surefire positive in its own way, just a little heavy-handed and doesn't do a lot for immersion. So next up we're given the name of the Asylum as a passive result of the character driving up the hill. This is pretty neat considering having it plant on screen really would have set a goofy tone. So having it operate as that purpose but being a part of the environment is very clever. The only improvement I could add is having it something completely natural, finding it by exploring in first person for example. This doesn't stop here however. When Miles is setting up his camera it shows us a reload of the batteries and the fact that they are collectible. He then pans to the front of the gate of the asylum but we can see his press identification card which gives us his name and that he works independently. Meaning he won't be reporting to anybody nor was he sent here by an organization. He then clicks through his night vision giving us a lot of information subtly which overall with all these things it makes you wonder why they did all of this bullshit. Anyway, they want to now move on with mechanics as opposed to more story and character-based guidance, so they open with your very first objective, which is a simple one. Investigate Mount Massive Asylum. They forego the whole look with mouse and walk with WSD or analog sticks in this game, and that alone is a controversial subject since the majority of gamers are well aware of this function and assume it from the get-go. The problem is, for those who play this game for their first game ever, and I think Red Barrel's almost crafted this game assuming that you've played a game or two previously. I guess I'm implying that this game was designed for a particular set of gamers, and those gamers by definition would have played games. Regardless, I like it when games leave that stuff out, but I see the argument for why it would be kept in. Once you've walked far enough, you'll find a gate and obviously be forced to open it. This game is an unmistakably stealthy, quiet, and cautious game, and for some reason, this dude just goes around slamming doors. I'm sneaking, I'm crouched, and I go to close a door, and the dude just slams it. Um, what the fuck are you talking about? The, the very first gameplay mechanic tutorial tells you it's about closing doors. To open them quickly, hit the left mouse button. To open them slowly, hold the mouse button. You spent the entire game not realizing that? You can turn off tutorials. You turned off the tutorials, and then blamed the game for not explaining that there is a way to open doors slowly. Um... Oh my god, you're called the Investor Gamer. That's priceless. Anyway, yes, you have a specific to Outlast mechanic for opening doors, and it is made clear right at the beginning, so players have the option to try and sneak. After that, they will tell you how to raise your camera. Then on to explaining that you will record events via the camera, and notes will be produced in the notebook for viewing, which explains the difference between notes and documents. Naturally, players will want to at least test out the whole notes thing, and that means almost all players will read the opening notes. So it's not going to be some Traeger Juice style joke, they will populate it with a genuinely useful piece of information, like the motivation for your character and why there is a reason to suspect this asylum aside from the whistleblower. Next up is Run. Hold down left shift and crouch with C or control depending on your preference. Soon after they will make sure players understand that there is a zoom function and how to use it. After that we get a small intro to the parkour elements of Outlast, that being jump, grab, and combining run with those things. And as you are approaching a tutorial-less world, you are put in a dark room to begin the horrors, and so the game tells you about the night vision and that you shouldn't be wasting it. It should be noted that at this point they don't tell you about the safety net of the night vision still working once you run out of battery but at a limited capacity. You are then forced to shimmy in order to move on, thus teaching you about shimmying. Right after you will find your first battery, efficiently explaining how that works and how to reload it. After that they tell you you need to jump to reach the vent in the adjacent room. Following that, once you find the first of many keys in the game being the key card, you are told that they will be stored in your reporter's notebook. Lastly, Chris Walker is activated and you are given a very strong message here. Hide in the locker, don't try to fight. 
They barely allow this to come naturally the first time, but again, it is something that they were clearly fostering thanks to it being such a sought-after experience. So what needs to be said here is the vast majority of the mechanics are introduced to the player within the courtyard, and players will be given a strong chance to experiment and understand them. This is very good. The method of delivery is standard in that it is straightforward text on a screen, while in the best-case scenario it would have been players engaging in these activities naturally. However, even something like Dark Souls has to have them straightforward tutorials. And hell, it could have been a lot worse. It certainly maintains the average person's immersion, I'm sure. However, that doesn't mean the game kept it up for the rest. I found it quite jarring that when I had gotten further and further into the sewer that suddenly a metal clank sound plays and I'm set with a task. Now I'm using this as an example because it will help prove a few things. Firstly, I had no idea that draining the ladder was what I needed to do to move on in this area. I saw what looked to be a straightforward path. Now if I was given the time to look around, I perhaps would have found the map that maintenance personnel created and realized that the ladder was the only way to progress thus leading me to want to find the ways to drain the water. You could have had Chris spawn after the first valve had been turned, but if that was too late, then simply have him on a timer spawns after 100 seconds of the player being in this set piece. But that's what leads me to my second point. The places that have any sense of action and choice are often that way because they were created before they were put together in the game. The set piece here would have been that you need to reach two keys and then get back to the beginning, all the while avoiding Chris. This makes enough sense on its own, however I think they crafted all the set pieces in the game, which we will tackle at a later date, and then added paths to them. They are connected very arbitrarily, and without forethought, similarly to the construction of Dark Souls 2. The idea here is that there are limited paths and you have to evade the enemy. The objective? Activate those valves. It doesn't matter that they have a real-world application, it just means that the developers want you to go in these directions and essentially touch base and then go back. This is why the objective slams onto the screen the second I'm officially in the set piece, to let me know things are now different. We aren't in a section that's connecting things anymore, we are in a section that requires me to do stuff. This level of guidance is so heavy-handed and revealing of the intentions of the game that you start to realize that it's all an illusion to get you to the point of being scared. Now that's not very insightful since that's bloody obvious, isn't it? What else would it be trying to do? Well that is kind of why I have such a personal disdain for this game. It is so hollow, and the things they use to dress it up are almost always in the way of the developers. Like they just want you to get on with the good parts, that the, the bits connecting them are just in the way. Like, like the developers are egging you on as you go, and the second you get there they get very excited. To try and explain this better, Amnesia was so heavy on subtlety that people thought it was a set piece of scares when you're making the initial potion. But there isn't even an enemy in the whole area, they played so meticulously with your expectations and washed as you slowly convinced yourself that you should be terrified that I see that as masterful. I see the sudden slap of objective and Chris launching from the sky as Outlast developers saying, well, you've walked around long enough, here's another thing. Though I don't want to show my hand too early. Let's say that the guidance in Outlast is mostly pretty good and my criticism there isn't even going to matter for a lot of people. They have a lot of good stuff in here, like how you approach a particularly dark area, so you naturally throw on the night vision and then in comes the wall rider, which is only visible with night vision. You'll be taught something very naturally there and it'll assist you later on even though they actually just force the night vision on later anyway. Finally, something as small as footprints of blood leading up a wall that you need to climb is something of a clever piece of guidance, so I would say as I said previously, this, this game has decent guidance. Not incredible guidance, just decent guidance, and it doesn't really take anything away from the player, but it also assists the player, so it's a good experience for the most part. Okay, this is a relatively big one, but let's be honest, they're all bloody big at this point. As in the previous segment, I essentially laid out all the mechanics aside from one that is kind of notable. During running in this game, you'll find that hitting Q or E will allow you to look back at your pursuer. The reason this works is that those buttons don't occupy a more meaningful move at default while sprinting. Unless, of course, you would remap it that way. Point is, I feel like it's one of those extremely few and thin innovations Outlast brought to the table, and in a game where you actually are often chased, this mechanic is not only useful, but it can really add to the tension of running away from a foe, confirming that it is indeed coming for you. Another game mechanic I had mixed feelings about was the look behind feature. Yeah, it was horrifying to peek over your shoulder and see some deranged creature charging after you, but it also means you're not looking where you're going, and are probably going to crash into a wall. Um, yes. Turning while running does make it difficult to see where you're going. Just like life itself. I don't know how to respond to that. Being a horror game, there are some cheap jump scares, and as someone who's playing with a high sensitivity mouse, that looks ridiculous on video. Here's what it looks like. Then turn down your sensitivity? Okay, already too much from reviewers that that's we're not we're not going there. 
So I touched on it before, but the mechanic of only gaining the notes from Miles if you have the camera up at the right times is annoying to me. The notes aren't that useful, they are more of an insight to the character, if that. It is odd that you can't actually get these notes regardless in terms of what they are narratively, and in reality it is a normal feature that they've just taken away from you. Many games have a self-writing character that you can access notes with, but Outlast demands that you have the cameras active. Now the camera itself isn't bad, it does give you the zoom and night vision, but there are moments where you would like to view things as a person with eyes as opposed to the green and grainy lens. This is still possible, but having the game tell you directly that you will not receive another feature unless you choose to use the grainy and double vision-y mode means that you will probably choose to use it. Is this an attempt to protect the game from being fully viewed to blur any small blemishes in terms of graphics? Perhaps. Ultimately, the screen is often better to look at without the camera. Everything is more realistic and sharp without the unnecessary busyness of the faint green grain. People are looking at it as a cool feature when it's actually an arbitrary restriction to something that isn't very meaningful in the first place. Anyway, if we try and move on by going from start to finish of the game and talk about how the things that we know about the mechanics translate to the gameplay, then I think we can get maybe a bit better of a focus here. It's pretty awesome that you don't have to hide in the locker despite the game telling you to. You can get around Chris, but it isn't super consistent. Regardless, the sequence is a strong introduction to what you are doing in the whole game. From there, you will be jumping into a lot of lockers. The first chase while fetching shit sequence is good stuff. If I'm not mistaken, they will mostly always find a way to move the enemies so you can't get through the whole thing without at least having to hide for significant portions of time. However, on my first playthroughs, this was the area that started to turn me off dramatically to the game, and it is more so to do with the enemy and how it behaves, combined with the fact that it felt like I was arbitrarily pushing buttons and pulling levers to receive the next part of the game. However, on subsequent playthroughs, I started getting pretty consistent on being able to complete the segment with what I would assume would be an intended experience. That is, hitting the switches, having some close calls with the enemy, and feeling a wave of relief as you exit the area. Now, the most significant interaction after this one would be the two men in the room where you need to activate the decontamination chamber. As you enter this room, you'll see a man beating a security officer to death, and it'll give off a pretty strong message that you need to make very little sound. This coupled with the fact that the man seems to be mostly blinded seems to be that it's kind of a pretty cool little set piece. We have an enemy that is reactive to sound rather than vision. He keeps an eye on you whenever you move, and if you want to access a document and a battery then you need to slink past him slowly. You make too much noise by moving around too close to him or running around, which is something I think they really should have developed since he doesn't seem to behave that way once you've activated the other part of the level. Once you've moved past him, every player will be ambushed by the fact that as soon as you open this door, there'll be a man in the following room that has been activated, and he is highly aggressive. You are now faced with the terrifying option to run away and piss off the guy who likes no sound, or face this psychopath. Well, I had an idea. Let's go to the sound guy, but immediately crouch once we're close and move to that bonus room. Maybe the psycho who's chasing me will be attacked by the one who doesn't like sound, and then they'll battle it out while I get what I want. As I moved through, I found that they simply respawned the sound guy in the middle of the hallway, and you will essentially be hit by him and then chased, and then you hide and then they're gone. Why? Why can't we be more interesting? Having different AI with different quirks, requiring different understanding and different gameplay. Why must we do this shit over and over again? Activate someone and run and hide and rinse and repeat. If only there was another game that had those ideas. Never fucking mind. So yes, it was odd to me that they introduced this sort of mechanic and then did nothing with it, then threw it out entirely. It simply left me confused why I have a brand new mechanic that becomes inconsistent then doesn't turn up the rest of the game. But hey, at least we got a great chase out of it, right? The chase sequence that begins with Chris Walker breaking through the glass and suddenly coming after you, and then ends with Chris Walker breaking through something else and coming right after you. This set of sequences has an interesting reward of jumping across the bed to freedom right at the beginning, but I imagine some players have a lot of difficulty with this whole thing, since Chris can actually, like, insta-kill you in the right scenarios. But yeah, there's only one way to run, and you do that. Always nice to see Walker though, right? Next up for the significant moments would be the sewer valve thing we end up doing. This opening map tells us I need to go forward and take the first exit on the right and reach the first valve, and then I need to take the third exit on the left while making use of the potential shortcut, making a left, right, and finally right. This reminded me of a lot of the maps you could find in the Penumbra series that really felt like an opportunity for players to assist themselves depending on the playstyle they would employ. The better parts to this were once I realized that I was bored of waiting for the enemy to leave the area when I was hiding in lockers, I found it far more entertaining to break out of the locker I was in, giving me time to close the door on him and making my way to the second valve. This made possible by the map they provided at the beginning of the area. This is a very entertaining and rewarding gameplay piece, but the more it happens, the less it stays effective. This isn't a problem for Outlast, however, since it doesn't happen again. Besides, the gameplay choice I made was also out of boredom, so make of that what you will. Next up is the sewer, with Chris. 
again. The gameplay aspect of this sequence is a little annoying in that you need to get to the center and the AI is clearly tempted towards you no matter what, so you are repelled from the goal, but perhaps that was the purpose of the sequence. Regardless, you get noticed by Chris no matter what, and you will narrowly escape no matter how far in front of him you are. As for anyone worrying about how I'm glossing over these parts to Outlast, I am speaking about them solely from a mechanical perspective, so we will return for the atmospheric side of things. So immediately after you have visited the sewer, you're on your way to Traeger. We have this gentleman. This sequence has no opportunity for catharsis, nothing in terms of satisfaction. Every person will simply be confused, and you will know it's because we are trying to push the idea of you never truly know when you're safe or when you're in danger. But the issue is that it doesn't work out this way because we all know we're in a game and we get confused simply because this game has a very clear line between danger and non-danger. It is mostly punctuated by the music. If ever we are killed without the soundtrack, it is jarring as fuck because as if the music forgot it existed, it just plows into the scene with trumpets. and you feel fucking strange about it. So when this guy runs up to you and causes you real damage, you're caught off guard and don't have any idea what the hell's going on, and then he runs away, so you're left to sit and wonder what the hell the game was trying to convey here. We will probably return to this guy. Then we come to the chase section, which is essentially built in a way that this engine was meant for, that this whole game was meant for. There's only one way to go, and it is fast. There's nothing really to criticize here other than literally describing it for what it is, extremely scripted and artificial, and uh, can result in trial and error. But if you enjoy it, then so be it. Next would be Traeger, and by golly this is the most expertly realized portion of the game. We have a very cool map, which we will approach later, giving players a sense of freedom but one way to go that takes them through the entire ward. This is very different from the previous level in that you aren't forced down one path, and while the first one had a wall of death chasing you, the Traeger sequence gives you ample opportunity to hide from him and run from him. And it literally isn't possible to evade him completely because they spawn him directly in front of you if you're doing particularly well in this sequence. But you can still escape very well. The mechanics get to shine in this sequence, they are the best they can be and the other movements in the game are dull compared, because they can't be quite as engaging by comparison and we will get onto that. The problem now is how this sequence should make you realize something about Outlast. This is the pinnacle of the environment and mechanics. The Traeger sequence is the game at its best. What I guess I'm saying is... This is all you are. This isn't offering a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. At worst, this is avoiding the bumbling AI while you find the developer-approved route to the next level. And at best, it is a scary hide-and-seek sequence which involves you desperately trying to reach the exit. Outlast at this point will only offer iterative experiences as we progress, and if Chris grabbing you at the beginning was them blowing the jump scale load early, this was them blowing the gameplay load early. But I would have to prove some of this, right? So let's try that. I assert that from Traeger the game takes a nosedive in quality and that the quality wasn't that high in the first place. I mean that in most aspects of the game, but let's stick to gameplay for now. Next up we need to get the sprinklers on, and none other than our main man Chris Walker has decided to defend them today. This is the sewer gameplay recycled right down to the fact that when you pick the valve closer to you in the opening, by the time you exit, Chris will have randomly found himself blocking your only exit. How coincidental. It's like they have the AI walk towards your location whenever you complete the smaller objectives. You even have the other objectives separated by a shimmy wall, just like it was in the shower. Iterative as fuck. Anyway, what was next? Okay, so soon after that we have this sequence that runs extremely difficult without night vision. The point here, I think, is to get the player terrified by being lost. Very lost. The thing was for me that I just tend to hug walls and move around the whole world waiting for one way out. You see, comparatively we have the choir hall and amnesia. The reason hugging the wall would help but ultimately be slower than just paying attention is that there were multiple rooms to explore and take items from. Not to mention that the place was one big misty room with actual directions installed. What made it terrifying was that there was an enemy here. He was roaming. True roaming, not outlast roaming. You could get away with never even seeing the enemy in Amnesia, and it would suit because you are afraid of these enemies and wherever they may be. Despite that, you would certainly hear them and feel their presence. In Outlast, they can't stand the idea of letting you escape without at least a glimpse of who our antagonist for this area is. Why, who is it this time? Oh, it's Chris Walker, of course, and he's a triple threat here, managing to teleport very efficiently with the moveset he probably learned from Jack Baker. As you move through the developer-approved adventure line, you'll find that you mostly avoid Chris, but he still spawns directly in front of you at the end. Once you pass that, the sequence is over, and you can look back thinking about how if it wasn't dark, you would have gone through the most boring set of lines made for what is essentially the most open and outside part of the game. There is a battery here and a document there off the beaten track, but ultimately those who are trying to get through it fast because they're frightened won't even be able to appreciate those small nuances. I just found the sequence to be a bit of a waste of time, also ridiculously punishing for those without batteries, but that is also something we'll get to. 
Next up is the famous three fuses sequence. It is possibly the poorest area of the game for level design, and I swear I'm getting to that, but holy Moses, collect three fuses and then collect a key and then move on. They managed to actually make this a thing. You can't just grab that fucking key from behind the grating. That would be too difficult. No, you have to find a way to get all three of these oddly protected fuses that are apparently being prepared as food or something. Once you have them, you can get the key and yeah, there's nothing else. Look, I think you see where I'm going with this, but I don't want to throw too much at you at once. So how about we say we end it there and uh, really get to the more chewy bits of the analysis of the levels as, uh, as we get to the next time. I really do appreciate all those who find my videos interesting, though I hope this series is what you are after, since I know you all wanted my perspective on Outlast, and I honestly hope this hasn't been a backfire for you, since I think you all rather are fond of the game. But this is this is how I do stuff, and I already told you, I just, I'm not a huge fan of Outlast. Regardless, I think we're about coming up to halfway through this whole thing, so make sure to catch the rest. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.